Hi guys, and welcome back to The Big Shift. Today we're going to go into the iconic world of boxing. I have a wonderful, wonderful guy here. Unbelievable history. He's lived an unbelievable life. He was, uh, you know, he's been coordinator and managed uh, five world champions. But of course, he's known for managing the wonderful Mike Tyson. Today I have from Las Vegas, Nevada, Steve Lott. Hi, Steve. Thanks for good joining morning. us. Good morning. Good morning. It's nice and cool out here. It looks wonderful, you know, and what a place. Tell us, what's it like over there now? Well, you know, the heroin business has come down quite a bit. But the, <laughs> co the, the, cocaine, the cocaine is really good. I'm making a Damn. lot of money, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and I got, I, got a, I got a great deal on used needles. So they've only been used twice, you know, so they're really guaranteed, you know. It's quiet here like everywhere else because of all the junk going on. Yeah, Las Vegas, what a city. I mean, all, all, all the viewers would, you know, would know about that city. So it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable that the changes that are happening around the world will also be there, right? You know, and it's kind of a strange time for us all, right? But we're coming out of this soon here. How's it over there for you guys? Well, uh, I don't live directly on the Strip or near the Strip. The Strip in Las Vegas is always a madhouse. So that, that traffic flow has come down dramatically, of course, because the hotels uh, closed up and no one could live in them and, or stay mm. in them. And the traffic that would usually come in on the weekends from uh, California has dropped down dramatically also. They're slowly trying to open up certain things. And, um, you know, the critical thing is science. You know, um, you have to go by what the doctors say and the medical professionals say, and you can't go by somebody's opinion who's never been a doctor. You know, it's like you telling me, like me telling you, I think that Jennifer Lopez and I could really get along. Uh, and someone would ask me, well, have you ever met her? No. Have you ever had dinner with her? No. Have you ever spoken to her? No. So how do you know? Well, that's my opinion, okay? But I would ask A-Rod, who has been dating her, what is she like? because he's been in that position. So the doctors know the public should listen to the doctors. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, you know, and opinions, you know, that are not uh, backed up, reinforced with facts, so uh, not good, right? <laughs> really, well, it's, especially, it's, it's, especially when there's misdirection all over the place, you know, and we really need a clarity as we're going forward, you know? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's tough for everyone. Um, you know, even for families, uh, a husband or wife who go to work, but now they have to stay home all day with their four kids. That's mm -hmm. good. You know, I, I don't even have a puppy. I don't even know what that would be like. But to have a family with a number of kids and being relegated to staying in that position all day, that's been tough. But, you know, it seems to be uh, uh, science. It seems to be conquering it little by little. Absolutely. Look. You know, we're navigating out of it slightly here. We have a plan and all that. And we certainly wish all you guys, you know, our neighbors over there in the States, all the very best with your same journey back towards health and normality. Now, um, Mike, Mike Tyson, he's an absolute, absolute icon. He's a freak of nature. I mean, I've got to say, I remember when I was younger, watching this unbelievably strong young kid who was absolutely fearless, was knocking all the top guys out as if it was nothing and couldn't be stopped. I thought this guy is just one of these people who's a freak of nature. They come along once in a, once in a century or something like that, you know, and surely he's always going to be regarded as one of the all time greats heavyweight champions of all time. You was there right back in the day with the young Mike and Gus, uh, Gus Diamato. Tell us about the very first time that you see Mike and you met Mike. Well, there's a little preface to that, just to bring you up to date. Uh, I began working with these two men, Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton. They had this fight film business. They owned all the fight films in the world. 
Ali, Joe Lewis, Jack Dempsey, Rocky Marciano, and they would license the films to television throughout the world. This is way before digital anything. It was a reel of film. I became a film editor there in 1973. And I think freeing up Jim and Bill from editing the films gave them the opportunity to manage fighters. Unbeknownst to me in the 70s, unbeknownst to me, they were funding the training camp where Custom Auto had in upstate New York. So, uh, you know, I had no idea. I was just editing films. Uh, but the first time I met Cus, Cus was very into the character of a person, the, uh, you know, what you're made of as a person. And he and Jim were very tight with that. Because Cus knew that I was close with Jim Jacobs, he kind of felt that I had some character as well. So in a very first discussion, it, it was very cerebral. Uh, Cus is very cerebral. And he said, uh, so you're the guy working with Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton. You know, they were funding the training camp. Uh, so how do you like working with the fighters uh, on film? And I said, oh, it's great. You know, looking at all day Muhammad Ali and Joe Lewis and Jack Dempsey. And then I said something interesting. And Sugar Ray Robinson, the greatest boxer of all time, pound for pound. And he paused. And he said, well, he, he may have been the greatest puncher of all time but not the greatest boxer of all time. And I had no idea what he was talking about. Technically. Yeah. It, 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 yeah. It, it, it took a long time for me to understand that a boxer is someone who's rather elusive in some way, shape, or form. Like a Sugar Ray Leonard or Muhammad yeah. Ali. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but Robinson got hit with everything. But when he hit you, the ball game was over. But it took me years to put all that together. Uh, that time period in the 70s was wonderful because this is way before pay-per-view and your audience would not remember this, but in the 50s and 60s and 70s, there was what was called closed circuit television. When a big fight took place, a movie theater would close down for the night with these big marquees, closed for fight. They bring in a big video projector on the screen and the signal would come in from Africa, from uh, Zaire, from Ali Foreman, or Foreman Frazier from Jamaica, or Foreman Roman from Tokyo. They would project it. Guys would pay 50 bucks to see it live on the projection screen. And um, uh, we were hired sometimes to do some filming of those fights. Uh, and it was always very exciting. And my boss, Jim Jacobs, said the next big fight, instead of us being here in New York and working on it, we're gonna to go to that fight. And I said, great, which one is it? I'll tell you in about a week, it should be announced within a week. He came in and said, okay, tell your girlfriend we're going on a trip. I said, where's that? He said, we're going to a place called Manila. And of course that was wow, the, the in Manila. Manila. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. that time period in the seventies, getting up to the Mike Tyson era, uh, Jim and Bill were managing some great fighters in the uh, late 70s, Wilfred Benitez, who was yeah. a great world champion. Edwin Rosario, who was a great world champion. Customano's training camp, as Jim and Bill were funding it, every six months, Cus would probably call and say, I got a kid, he may be something. And they would probably say, great Cus, keep us surprised." Six months and six months. In 1980, he called and said, I got a kid, and he's going to be something. His name is Mike Tyson. And they probably said, great, Cuss, let us know. The, the uh, concept, the odds of a trainer telling someone that my kid is going to be champion, and that actually happening is one of a thousand. You always hear that from trainers and boxers. Absolutely. This kid, my kid, this kid. Some... But, of course, that was the beginning of the Mike Tyson era with – Jim Jacobs, Bill Caton, Customato, and it took five years of Customato's life to get Mike to where you remember seeing him, yeah. and the mainstream began seeing him. This is this is what I find fascinating, Steve, because we're always great with the Phillies product, right? But the blood, sweat, and tears, the real innovation, the real grindstone. Solving the problems where I certainly know the magic really is with the other people who help you do that is a magical time. 
So now I know Mike, you know, he come he come from a tough neighborhood, right? You know, it's very tough for him. Can you remember that when you first met him and he was that awkward kind of kind of kid, you know, who still had to go a bit, what that was like for him? I mean, I know there was a lot of money, a lot of time and effort put into him, but what was he actually like on that first first meeting? What was your first thoughts apart from, wow, this kid's strong, you know, you know, we think we can mold something with this with this kid. Well, uh, I never spent much time, I spent very little time going to Catskill from New York City to Catskill is about uh, 200 kilometers. So uh, I never, I went there twice. Uh, Mike came to the city with Custom Auto maybe twice and I saw him uh, for 10 seconds each time. In my mind, he was just a kid and Custom Auto's fighter, but I was already traveling with Benitez and Rosario so to me, it's like dating J-Lo and then, you know, having to see Jenny Jenkins, you know, was completely <laughs> different. Okay. <laughs> so, but he was cussing. I didn't know him at all until he became a pro. And when he became a pro in 1985, uh, he would be fighting very often, but Cus permitted him to take off a day in between the fights to come to New York City. And Cus asked me, can he stay at your apartment, Steve, for that one night? I said, no problem. Uh, at that point in 1985, he was still completely unknown. Not one manager, not one promoter, not one trainer, no TV stations, knew of Mike Tyson. The only thing that had gotten out was that the sparring partners were apprised that this kid, if you go in for sparring, He's very big puncher. That's the only thing that got out there. And that's why a huge amount of money was spent by the managers, Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton, to bring in sparring partners back then at $1,000 a week. Now, I don't even know if the heavyweight champions today give their sparring partners $1,000 a week, but that's what they did back then. So to get to your point, when Mike came in and began spending a day at my place, he was just a terrific friend. Very low key. Remember, five years of custom motto. It's like being a, a, a math student and spending five years with Stephen Hawking and Albert Einstein. All of that drilling Absolutely. day by day by day to bring Mike out of the streets and make him understand that he doesn't have to act like that. He can trust some people, he doesn't have to trust all of them but he can trust some people and that he can be accepted and his confidence level would rise. So what I had was the, and Jim and Bill had was, we were the beneficiaries of that five years of, of Mike Tyson. Terrific kid, no ego, no, he wasn't ostentatious, very low key, very affectionate. If you were his friend and he had very few, he would, he would be the best friend in the world. And that was way before he became anything. Fight after fight after fight. No one knew of him. So that was the initial uh, feeling I got from him. He was just a terrific kid, my friend. But I never thought in a million years that he would be the heavyweight champion. Yeah, it's so it's so interesting. Thanks for that, Steve. You know, it, it certainly tells me a lot. You know, and I know the when we come from the street, you know, we certainly bring a lot with us as traumas, ways of thinking, all that. I mean, you know, even people who you know my my journey to internally engineer that out of you is a process, which is not an overnight thing. It takes a lot of support. It takes some real wise heads who see you even more than you see yourself, right? You know, it takes a lot of a lot of um a lot of support, you know, and my I certainly had that. So I, lo I love the analogy you were saying about the five years. Because five years is a good is a good chunk of chunk of time, right? Well, so yes, yeah, so I'm getting there. He would have been that 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 really committed student at that time. And I suppose it would have been times it was always easy for Gus to deal with Mike, or it was even easy for Mike to deal with Mike. But you know what a master mentor Gus uh, Diamato was. You know, and especially this relationship with. Mike, you know, it produced unbelievable stuff, right? Well, Cus was very cerebral. Yeah. Uh, he knew that 
deep down, if Mike was induced, uh, 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 if there were suggestions made to him, if he was advised of what could be better and better and better for him, it didn't happen overnight. There were, I'm sure there were horror stories of what went on up there. Yeah. But Huss had this vision. He's been on around a long time. He was 70 years old. He had the vision of what Mike could become if m the physical part of boxing is very simple, incredibly simple. It's the mental and emotional part that yeah. you don't understand. When a fighter walks in the ring, everyone just sees him fight. They don't know that mentally and emotionally, there's something going on up there. It's the same thing with a baseball player. It's not like they get up there and just their heart is yeah, pounding. Well, they're they're mm -hmm. professionals, soccer players. We're on the field. It's not like they're, hey, we're playing soccer. Their heart is pounding. It, the whole world is watching. You know? So uh, mm -hmm. Cus knew that it will take some time. He had the patience and the patience to try to maybe in a way strip off the layers of Mike Tyson from the street punk mentality that Mike had to get to the real person underneath. And it all depends on who's around you. Uh, the analogy would be for parents, if their children are surrounded by other good children, it kind of rubs off in some way. But yeah. if their children are surrounded by very wild kids, that can rub off it as well. In Brooklyn, Mike was surrounded by very bad kids. With Cuss, everyone around Cuss had character, had good intention. And Cuss knew it wouldn't happen overnight, but those good intentions would slowly um, um, get into Mike Tyson's brain and his emotions. And that's exactly what happened. In 1985, when he was introduced to the world under a small umbrella, he had this already, uh, the five years of Customata. And, and that's what uh, made him so, uh, endure, uh, so uh, affectionate and loving, because he knew that anyone Cus trusted he knew that person was a friend. And yeah. that's a very tough thing to recognize if someone else is has character and is your friend. And Mike trusted Cus in his belief of who had character and who had not. Yeah, no, I, I, I can see that. And uh, certainly Mike was very lucky, you know, uh, you know, in his journey, you know, to have someone like that. I'm really fascinated. Tell, what do you think? I mean, I know this magical Randy skills as well as such a life of experience at that time, you know, that Gus had. But what do you think it was that really made Gus the Amato special and innovative in the way that, you know, he applied his work and his strategy to the people under his umbrella, Steve? Well, I would say there are, there are three things. Uh, number one, his experience, having been in boxing for uh, 40, 30, 40 years, 50 years before Mike got there. Number two, his mental prowess of observing a fight year after year after year and examining it as the way a coronary heart surgeon would examine his operation under an electron microscope of some type. Cus would look at the fight and analyze and say, why did he get hit at this precise moment in this fight? And why didn't he get hit in this precise moment at this fight? Year after year after year, analyzing like a computer, getting a, a more memory. Uh, instead of one uh, kilobyte, it's one megabyte. Instead of one megabyte, it's one terabyte. All of that information started to uh, be uh, into Cus's brain. And he kept analyzing it. And that became the key item that Cus did that I've never seen any other trainer try to incorporate. And that key thing was head motion. That's the most critical thing in boxing. And if you and I walked into any gym in the world, at any time in the world, you would never hear a trainer drill their kid on head motion hundreds of hours in front of the mirror, hundreds of hours on the mitts, hundreds of hours on the bag, in sparring. 
day after day, week after week, month after month. So Cus analyzed all that and said, okay, there's a couple of things that fighters do where in which they don't get hit. And if they don't do these particular things, they get hit 99.9% of the time. What are those two things? That was the computer process. That made Cus very special. Uh, the mental and emotional makeup is a third factor. Mm -hmm. He knew that fighters, like any other athlete, a concert pianist just doesn't go out there and play. You know, they, they're pros. They know they, the, the definition is of a pro is someone who can do what they are meant to do under pressure. That's the mark of a professional. A lot of fighters don't make it because they can't do it under pressure. A lot of pianists can't do it because once the audience is full, they just freeze up, they can't do it. But the ones we see are the ones that can handle it under pressure. He knew that the mental and emotional makeup is critical. And then some other fine things, which were almost like a, an extraterrestrial would come down and drill this into a fighter. And the last thing was the number system of placing a punch and a number together so that there's a reaction from the fighter when the number is called out. Mm -hmm. And it was so brilliant that it's beyond belief. When we tried that with other fighters, it's magical. So, in, you know, and for your audience, instead of yelling out, left hook to the body, right hook to the body, left hook to the head. Yeah. Right hook to the head. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. The, the customer would say, five, six, one, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom. The fighter would do Another that. The combination. They've been, they've been taught to do that a thousand times. Uh -huh. And from the corner, mm. you can't yell out. Left hook to the body. Right hook to five, six, one, two. Boom. The fighter does it right away. So those three things, the experience, seeing when a fighter gets hit, when he doesn't get hit, analyzing that, the mental and emotional factor, and the number system, the, and the patience to take all that together. It's masterful, really. And I mean, certainly anything I've ever done, but people, I don't think people really appreciate boxing as the hardest sport out there, really. There are other sports we see, you know, that, but for, you know, the paddlers, for the, for the strategy, for the, for the tactics, you know, of boxing, of being elusive, of, you know, I mean, we see Arlie, you, you know, the rope dope It's just absolutely, you know, different, different strategies. I mean, even with Mike, you know, I can remember, and a lot of people, he had a lot of innovation. And one of his things, I mean, you know, you're talking about the head movement, Steve. We would see that constantly with him. He was he was masterful at it and then he would come up under tie and it was the uppercut that was deadly to a lot of opponents and you used to see him faint a lot with that and it was deadly he would really pull them into that so they would have worked on that these kind of strategies right for people out there who would remember remember mike and his say day right well there's two things now there's what you mentioned about uh boxers being so special mm. in every sport in uh, European soccer, you could be down four to zero and still come back and win the, win the match. In baseball, American baseball, you can strike out three times and then hit the game-winning home run. In basketball, you can miss 14 free throws and then hit the game winner. In uh, uh, football, you can drop American football. You can drop four passes and then make the game winning catch in boxing one punch and the ball game is over the ball game is over you cannot take out your fighter and put in a different fighter you can do that in american baseball in american football in american basketball one guy comes in one guy goes out in tennis you can lose the first three two um, sets and come back to win boxing one punch the ball game is over and that's what makes uh, fighters very special in difference to every other sport. For Mike, people don't understand the mentality of a fighter and what happens when they get in a ring. 
And that was what made Smite special. Not that he was a good puncher. He was a good puncher. He was a really good puncher. But what was more important was the confidence he had knowing he was not going to get hit. So, for example, if you and I are boxing and we're in the ring, we'd be a little inhibited by what was going to happen. You may not want to really load up with something, and I might not really want to load up with something. But if I was wearing a blindfold, completely blind, and you saw me, you would come in there and throw your biggest shot because you're not inhibited in any way, shape, or form. That was in Mike's mind. He knew that the chance of him getting hit was minuscule. What that does for a fighter is like putting a blindfold on the other guy. It gives you the confidence not only to come in close, but to throw those bombs without in any inhibition. So the public doesn't understand that that part of it is a huge, huge part of boxing, the mental and emotional part of it. Yeah, that's that is uh, that's a great analogy. It really is. Do you know what I mean? So, um, early early in this career, when you started to see this explosive power, when did you start to realize that, knowing Mike, that this kid's really special? Was there uh, a I did that yeah. got that? Yeah, I, I did not know that. I did not recognize him. He was just fun yeah. to be around. It was exciting. But the idea of a young kid, heavyweight, uh, becoming someone who is a, 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 a contender in some way, shape, or form, or being number one, or even being is, is remote, is remote. I just like being there because uh, this is way before digital anything, uh, working with the managers, Jacobs and Caton. I was known as something like, uh, I think the press called me a watchdog. I was responsible for Mike to make sure everything was okay. And all I did with back then was photograph the fight from ringside with old film. This is back before digital. And then having it, this is, this is the way the managers thought. And it may even be that they were the first social media people on the planet. Yeah. I shot the fight with photographs, send them in the laboratory. They come back with a contact sheet. We make prints one by one in envelopes with a stamp and an address to newspapers and magazines. There'd be a video guy in the arena, Mike's first fight, second fight, third fight. We get the tape from him back to New York, make copies, VHS, which very few of your young audience remember. Well, let's go back. Okay, in an envelope, address, stamps, TV stations. Because they knew that the marketing of a fighter was critical. I, I would seriously doubt that any manager does that today, number one. And of course, it's much easier today because there's Facebook and, you, and uh, uh, Instagram and things like that. It doesn't exist 40 years ago when Mike was coming up, 1985, 1984. So they, they, they did that. So I did not know that Mike would be that special. We were doing our job, but as he got better and better, the word got out that he's something. And it wasn't until the first time, maybe his eighth pro fight, that a local New York newscaster on TV, a sports guy, said, hey, there's a new kid on the block. Uh, he's fighting up in Mike Tice uh, in Catskill, New York. Let's take a look at his fight from last night. And they show the clip of Mike Tyson. That was perhaps the first time I thought, wow, this is interesting that a a local news station in New York City would put on a clip of a fight that took place 200 kilometers away. That doesn't happen. So uh, maybe the newscaster saw something in potential. And fight by fight, it became a little bit more uh, uh, obvious that he was going to be somebody. But still, the managers were not getting any calls from promoters or TV stations or networks to say, oh, we got to get this kid. Why? It's still remote that he's going to get to that level. There was Larry Holmes. Mm. There was Tim Witherspoon. These, you know, Michael Dokes, these guys that were world champions at the time. So the, uh, the, 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 uh, it was so remote that he was under the radar. It took, it took about nine or 10 months before he got to be at that level. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, and he was so young. He was so young when he hit the big time. And, you know, he, he was such a deadly finisher. I mean, I, you know, at that time, you know, I know what I certainly think, and I would, the viewers who knew of Mike Tyson in his prime, I'm sure they would agree with me. But I have to ask you, at that time when he hit the big time and he was deadly finishing with all, all these big names that was put in front of him, he had a certain flair, a certain style. Was there anyone that you guys was really scared of putting in the ring with Mike? Well, Mike had so much I don't know where he got him. I, I just don't know. But the confidence level he had was such an unusual thing about the inner belief which cost drilled in him that you're going to be the best and you may be the best. You'll definitely be the youngest champion of all time and you may go down as the best boxer, fighter of all time. So, so Mike's belief in that, it, 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 there was never a case where even after Cus died, when Jim and Bill took over, there was never a case where the managers would call the trainer, Kevin Rooney, and say, Mike's next fight is in uh, Texas. Uh, he'll be fighting Eddie Richardson. And Kevin Rooney said, we're going to Texas next week. Mike didn't even care who the other fighter was. That's how much belief he had. And uh, just a touchstone to that was in 1987, Mike had fought uh, a tough guy named Tony Tucker for a unification fight. Yeah. And a, yeah. And, and a week later, we went to Chicago because one of Mike's uh, teammates, Edwin Rosario, was defending the lightweight championship. And the manager, Jim Jacobs, and I were in a room. Mike's on the couch, just uh, Mike was on the couch, just chilling out, you know, waiting for the next day. And Jim was on the phone with the promoter, Don King. And the next fight that was scheduled on paper was Mike going to Tokyo in March. <laughs> but there was time in between for one particular fight in January. There was time. And on the phone, Jim and Don King were discussing it. And um, he said, okay, let me just check with Mike. Uh, and Jim put the phone down and for a second. He said, uh, you know, and Mike is just chilling. Mike, uh, we can get uh, Larry Holmes in uh, January. Is that okay? And Mike went, like that. Not Larry. Larry. Oh, well, yeah. Larry Holmes. You know, Larry. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. The, the idea of Mike saying, no, no, he's, he, I don't know. You know, there was nothing. The rumors of, the one rumor that's so funny to me is that Mike or whoever was around him, he was always afraid of George Foreman. That was, that's, that was the big rumor. And when Mike was champion, George wasn't even boxing at that time. Just at the end of the time period where he was with us, uh, George Foreman entered the pro ranks. It was number 99 and 85. He wasn't even in the top 10. So the idea of Mike dreaming about not fighting George Foreman, it, it, you know, it, these are the type of, again, opinions. Oh, my opinion is that George would be, well, you know, if they got in the ring and fought, you know, my opinion could be that, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali would be uh, Mike Tyson or Mike would be Ali. That's opinion. Anybody can have their opinion. That's fine. That's no fine. problem. But, you know, when it comes down to being in the room with Mike and being told this is who you're fighting and seeing the results of Mike's uh, uh, retort in some way, I've never seen Mike afraid of anything, you know. I was I was dying. The pressure on me yeah. <laughs> was much more than that of Mike. And the reason is that uh, uh, when Mike became champion, I was responsible for Mike 24 hours a day. And Mike was, at that time, the most valuable sports property in the world. It's like having a mean vase. Okay, that was Mike. He handled it brilliantly. He never showed any emotions, any trepidation. I was, I never showed it, but I was dying because I knew I was responsible. I was more intimidated by the managers in New York who were trusting me some of that the most valuable sports yeah. property. So whenever Jim Jacobs would call, maybe once a week, hey Steve, how's everything going? Great, no, no problem. Terrific. I'll speak to you next week. 
But there was once where he called and the first thing he said, Steve, right away, I knew I was in deep, deep duty. Okay, right away. So, uh, but that's the responsibility you have of having someone like that and making sure that everything goes right. So he handled it brilliantly because of Customado. And so much attention, it has to be said, you know, at that time, unbelievable global constant press attention. When we're talking about conflict, Don King, the man himself. Now, look, I've personally seen some interviews with Mike where he wasn't happy with Don. He said, you been there, and he flung the thing off and he walked away. You know, he walked away. <laughs> he hasn't been too happy, right? Now, he said, look, you know, I know Don's story too, but what was actually the dynamic between them two? Well, you have to now, remember now for your audience, when you go back in history, time becomes compressed. Yeah. And people don't remember 85 to 88 when I worked with Mike and he lived with me in my apartment. We shared an apartment. Of all of the different sequences of events that took place and everything that transpired at that time period, the managers, knowing that Mike was so special, they bypassed the promoters and they went right to HBO mm -hmm. to make a deal directly with them because HBO realized that Mike was such an attraction that it would inspire more people to subscribe to HBO to pay that monthly fee. Now, some of the press were shocked at the deal that Jacob and Kate made. Now it seems minuscule. At that time, it was $26 million for six fights on HBO. That was just the TV money, yeah. not the arena, not worldwide sales. That was just HBO. Yeah. The, you know, uh, back then, when you, said about the, when you said about the world watching Mike and being under, you have to remember that, let's take soccer for a moment, European soccer. When the, when the world championships are played in Europe somewhere or wherever, there might be 500,000 people in the United States watching that, a million people watching that in the United States. Maybe some in China, maybe some in Asia, maybe some in Africa. It's a big event, the World Soccer Gym. But when oh, baseball in the United States, when the World Series takes place, you might get some you know, 100,000 families in England watching it. Football, uh, NFL championships, 100,000 people in France watching it. Um, uh, basketball, 200,000 people in, in, in Germany watching it. But when Mike fought, the whole world was watching the whole world at one shot. And an example of that was in 1987, Tokyo had built this new dome stadium. It was called the Tokyo Dome. And they wanted to start with a big event that would show the world that this new stadium was open for business. Whether it was music events or athletic events or concerts or anything, they're open. They had to figure out what first event to put on that would show the world they're open for business. Their choices were Madonna, Michael Jackson, Bruce Springsteen, Rolling Stones, Billy Joel, Mike Tyson. They picked Mike Tyson. Why? Because if Michael Jackson is doing a concert in Tokyo, nobody in New York knows about him because he's on tour somewhere. If Madonna is doing a concert in, in Germany, nobody in New York knows about it. She's on tour. But when Mike Tyson fights, the whole world shuts down. True. And everyone's gonna watch. So they Big realized event. that to put a, a, a spotlight on their arena for the whole world to see in one shot, the monies they paid were enormous. And Mike, of course, was spectacular in the fight but they knew that that spotlight would put uh, uh, their arena on the map. And that's the type of drawing his magnetism, his power in the public eye, that drawing power. Why? Because he was entertaining. That's the key thing in boxing. And that's what Customano always drilled in his fighters that no other trainer does. You got to hit, 
not get hit, but still be entertaining. There are many fighters today that can hit and not get hit, but they're not entertaining. So don't not get the one. Draw, the big not, 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 not one. Yeah. You know, to be perfectly honest, in the United States, mm-hmm. if you, uh, you know, in 1980, 81, 82, 83, 84, if you walk down any street and say, you know who Sugar Ray Leonard is? Oh, yeah, well, he was the Olympic champion. You know who Larry Holmes is? Oh, yeah, he's the heavyweight champion, isn't he? You know who uh, Roberto Duran is? Oh, that's the Manos de Piedra guy. He quit it. All due respect to the heavyweight champions today. Now, I just talk about the United States. You walk down any street and say, who's Anthony Joshua? No one would know. Who's um, yeah. uh, Tyson Fury? No one would know. The press and is a funny the, thing. Maybe a the, bit more about the, Tyson, but the press is a funny thing, isn't it? Well, yeah, well. The reach, then, the, the actual, for American, the international reach. Yeah, and then for American, Deontay Wilder is the American. American. No one would know his name. No one. Okay, <laughs> because in the 80s, there wasn't that type of competition mm. for boxing. It was so enormous. Mm. Today, two things. The fighters are not exciting, number one. And number two, there's so much competition mm. from the other sports. I'm talking particularly in the United States, mm. where baseball, football, basketball in the 80s, the production was good, but it wasn't like it is today Hollywood star, incredible production. And the number two thing, which is really, number two is the fighters are not exciting. And number three, the really big factor is UFC. Yeah. The UFC has pulled away the mainstream from boxing. The mainstream now is much different than it was in the 80s. The mainstream today is a younger audience, and their attention span is very short. If they're not entertained right away with something that's explosive, they're off the screen. And that's why every motion picture in the theaters or online is vampires, supernatural, Star Wars, gorillas from the movie, God, God, Godzilla versus King Kong. Yeah. That's the number one film in the, in the world. Okay. It, from now on, it won't be Titanic. It won't be going with the wind. It'll be that younger audience. And that's what I'm indebted to the promoters today mm. who keep spending money on promoting fights. They cannot get any revenue from the arena because no one's permitted in. There's no sponsorship money. So they have to put up their own money to keep DAZN or Eddie Hearn or any of those. They're putting in their own money to keep these fights alive. Without them, boxing would be dead. Yeah. And just to explain to your audience about UFC, there's a couple of things about the UFC which gets them over boxing. Number one is the inherent action in the ring. You never know what's going to happen. A guy's arm is going to get broken. His leg is going to get broken. His eyes are going to get torn out. He's going to be on the canvas. going to pound it away. So the action draws that mainstream like King Kong versus Godzilla, you don't know what's going to happen. Or even more analogy, the great motion picture called Jaws with Steven Spielberg, where the shark jumps out of the water. Every time that shark jumped out of the water, even if you've seen the film, it's a bit of a a shock. So that's what the UFC has over boxing. You never know what's going to happen. In boxing, punch, move, punch, and move. So the inherent action UFC has over boxing. The other thing they did that was brilliant is make the fights short. Four rounds, maybe five, four rounds, five. One fight's over, next fight is in. One fight is over, next fight is in. It keeps the mainstream keeping watching. In boxing, by round eight or nine, unless you're a boxing fan now, yes, they will watch. But if mainstream, no. (laughs) So that's the competition boxing has. And that's why I'm indebted to the fighters for fighting and especially the promoters who put up their money. But what we have to hope for is to get one fighter, one fighter who can captivate the mainstream. That's the key thing. And here's the bottom line. It's not the fighter's fault that they don't become that type of attraction. 
It's the trainer's fault that they don't become that type of attraction. Mm. They teach their fighters to fight like amateurs. Back up, move, punch, move. That would be great if you're an amateur. But in today's world, there's got to be action. There's got to be the type of ferocity that you mentioned about Mike Tyson. The fighters from the 80s, if they were around today, they'd be billionaires. A young Sugar Ray Leonard, a young oh. Marvin Hagler, Masterful. a young Larry Holmes, Man. a young Ray Boom Boom Mancini. The guys today, the reason... I have to ask has, you. Yeah, yeah, so, Steve, yeah. listen. Yeah. No, I'm going to ask you. For all the UK fans out there, there's a big fight here. It's brewing. You're going to know who it is. Uh, Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua. Mm -hmm. Who's going to win? Uh, I don't know. But it will not be exciting. What's your it instinct, be, Steve? Going to be, it's, going to be you very, it's going to be a very conservative fight. Because neither guy is a blockbuster puncher monster. Joshua is very mechanical. He's not slick. He's yeah. very mechanical, very strong, tremendous heart, but very mechanical. Uh, uh, um, uh, Tyson Fury is very slick in there, but he doesn't come out winging shots. So there's going to be a little chess game going on, for round after round after round after round. In England, it's going to be huge. Yeah. yeah. But just remember now that when Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder fought – in uh, the MGM last year, or whatever. Yeah, it was. yeah, okay. yeah. The Mike Tyson exhibition with Roy Jones did almost twice the pay per view that the heavyweight championship did. Since that was just an exhibition, okay. And I'm sure that people in Europe was watching that because of Mike Tyson's name. Now in the United States, when Joshua fights Tyson Fury. They always go by what's called the pay-per-view numbers, mm. people hitting to one. It might be 700,000, 800,000 in that, in that range somewhere. The Mike Tyson fight did 1.2 million, okay? Now, if there was a fighter, whether it was from Germany or England or France, that was a bomber that came out blistering the Joshua Fury fight, if either one of them was that type of fighter, in the United States, the pay-per-view numbers would be a million, 1.2 million, 1.3 million. I know over there, it's going to sell out everything. Yeah. But you have to remember, it's not the entire world. Absolutely. Okay? It's not the entire world. So I don't know who would win. Whoever gets hit with the first big punch will probably lose. Whoever lands the first big punch will probably win. But I think it's going to be a chess match for round after round. After. That's usually what happens in heavyweight championship fights. Yeah. Because you know? let's, right? Let, yeah, let's, uh, you know, yeah, let's put it this way. One punch is, you know, one punch. Let's put it this way. In the Fury versus Deontay Wilder fight, yeah. if you took away the knockdowns, if you took them away, yeah, and you put the fight on TV, yeah, you turn off the sound, and you suspend belief, you don't know who's fighting. You just see two big guys fighting. But there's no knockdowns. There's nothing happening. There's nothing happening. Now, you throw in the fact that it's the heavyweight championship and it's, it's a, a, an Englishman versus an American and they build it up with the PR and the press. Yeah, but if you suspend belief that you don't know and you watch for the first time and you're mainstream after two rounds, that's thanks very much. I'm having dinner. Yeah. So let's go back to Mike, right? What do you think was the main things, really succinctly, that made him so special, Steve? His three yeah. or five things that straight on the nose that made him so special. Do you know? Because you know, you got an insight to this. Uh, his ability to master his mental and emotional status his mental and emotional level in the ring. That was critical because the more relaxed you are in sports, I don't know about any other profession, but I would imagine it's the same for anything. The more relaxed you are, if you practice something over and over and over, it's easier to do. 
So particularly for Mike, repetition, yeah. because he was he was taught these specific skills, mm. he was able to use his mental and emotional strength to relax to a point where they came out, and that was two facets: critical, the head motion, and the punching power. He was there was no inhibition in him to punch. the The head motion was the most critical. And it was shocking, not shocking, but it's surprising that from 85 to 88, his prime, and we'll get into what prime means because the boxing world has no idea of what that means. In his prime, when he was fighting and defending the championship, in any one of those fights, when he got hit, the commentators went berserk. Wow, Mike Tyson got hit. Every, every fighter gets hit. You know? But it was so unusual for Mike to get hit with anything that was of, of consequence. And I believe it was hit twice to where there was some reaction in, in the uh, Bone Crusher Smith fight in 1987. In the last 10 seconds, he got hit with a, a good right hand. He wobbled, but then came back punching. In the Tony Tucker fight in round one, as Mike was coming in, he got hit with a little left uppercut and he, he back, it wobbled him. Because Mike fights, and once again, the boxing guys, boxing fans don't understand what happens with your feet when you're boxing. And Mike kept his feet rather parallel. And when you hit with something, it has a tendency to, to rock a little bit. If you had your feet like that, there would not be that rocking motion. But this enables you to punch much harder with both hands. So when Mike got hit with that uppercut, it backed him up, but he kept on attacking. But the, the commentators went wild at Mike just, you know, um, uh, being knocked off balance. That's how incredibly sophisticated he was with the ability not to get hit. Now, that was, that was the key thing in Mike Tyson. Not getting hit means that it gives you the confidence, as we discussed before, to load up on your punches. And those couple of things, it was un it had not been seen in a long time, in a long time. And once again, the competition from the other sports was minuscule, and the whole world was watching. That's what put Mike under the spotlight. So, a game for the UK. I can remember another iconic moment, right, where it all went wild. Frank Bruno, right, good old Frank Bruno. Got friends who know him very well. But on that day he came over there, there was the usual PR and hype, Steve. And he actually got through with one, right? Now there's been this big thing that could he or couldn't he if he had a because, you know, I think it's fair to say Mike spooked most of his his opponents. It was definitely that psychological warfare and he was very good at it. Absolutely. So from what I see, and I watched that fight. Frank was a little bit, he didn't have, he didn't, he wasn't at the level of warrior confidence, shall we say, mentally fit in that way that, hey, I don't care, man, I'm going to ball those, I don't care who's in here, I'm going to keep going. Of course, it was Mike Tyson, but, but when he hit him, there was this big debate, Steve, about he actually, he shook Mike with that punch, he got one through, and if he had kept going, he had a chance of finishing it. Do you remember that? Well, if, you know, of course, they, they fought twice. Yeah. Uh, but that was after Mike left us. We were not involved with Mike in, at any point. Once he got the lawsuit between the manager, Bill Caton, yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. save Mike from Don King. Yeah. And Don King conning Mike and your audience, they may not understand about how great con men can be. And Don King was one of the greatest con men of all time. But those That's fights with Bruno, the first one, with Mike def uh, defending his championship, uh, Bruno has tremendous heart and tremendous character and tremendous fighting spirit. But he's very mechanical. He never, ever moves his head, ever. Now, Mike, even after he left us, while his mental and emotional stability was beginning to wane because he was not happy. Technically, his ability started to wane a little bit. He still had a good chin. 
and he did get hit. But the difference in the overall um, uh, assets of each fighter, Mike had more assets to use. There's no guarantee you're not going to get hit. And I was not surprised that Mike got hit. But his overall assets were just a little better. I can't speak to Bruno's mental or emotional state because I would have no idea. My opinion would be worth zero. But I can attest to what I know of Mike Tyson because I know when you live with someone mm. as a friend and you see him under pressure every day and you see how he reacts year after year after year, unless you're an idiot, you get to understand what happens within the fighter. So with the Bruno fight, the first fight, uh, it was, Mike was still kind of waning, but he had more assets. In the second fight where Bruno was the champ, Mike still had a little bit more assets, but they were waning. His mental and emotional status is more important than what you can do physically. And that's what the boxing world doesn't understand. That if a fighter is a Sugar Ray Leonard, he, no matter what happens, his mental and emotional st stability is tremendous. Muhammad Ali, tremendous. Marvin Hagler, tremendous. Those got there's nothing that will uh, dissipate their mental and emotional strength. But with Mike, he was mentally and emotionally susceptible to the people around him. When they were good, his mental and emotional status was on top of the world. But when they were bad, that influence waned that. And that's what affected Mike. But against Bruno, Mike had just a little bit more assets. You know what you're saying there about, there's an old saying here, my mother used to say, Stephen, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's so simple, but it's so true, right? right. You know, they have such a gift of making things simple. They're so wise, right? And I think it's like that for most people. And when you're at the top, you know, you, you know, of sport or certainly anything else, who is around you is absolutely crucial. You know, this is another fundamental that I, you know, because he's had quite a history, Mike. I mean, he, you know, he's still there now. You know, he does other things and, you know, he's doing his podcasting and different stuff. And, you know, he's still there in the news. He's still a big draw, even now in the media, because of all that time back there, you know. I mean, so... I've had a question come up in my mind. Mama Dali, you know, a legend, just like Mike. Now, I know that you go right the way back to the old days with many of these guys, and you've met them all, Steve. I have to ask, both of them in their kind of prime, you know, an Ali and a Mike, how would that fight have shaped up, really? I'm fascinated in your mind. Well, the first thing is I would buy the ticket to watch that. I would watch the pay-per-view. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 For some reason, I, I get the feeling that Ali's mental emotional ability to control himself was 100%. Yeah. Mike was only 20, 21 years old. Yeah. Only 25 amateur fights. And while he was confident, his experience level was not up to Ali's. Yeah. I think the first time they fought, I don't want to use this word der in being derogatory, but Ali would stink him out. Yeah. He would stink him out. If Tony Tucker was able to stay away enough for 12 rounds, if Bone Crusher Smith was able to stay away for 12 rounds, then Muhammad Ali would be able to stay away for 12 rounds and win a decision. But the second time they fought, and Mike in his mind said, he can't punch. He just ran. I it was silly for me not to, not to chase him down. The second time they fought, it would be a disaster for Ali. It would be a disaster. Because Mike would come in there winging shots. And once again, you have to remember, prime. Even Ali at his prime, there were points in there where he got dropped. and got dropped by Henry Cooper in 63. He got chased out of the ring by 175-pound Doug Jones that same year. Uh, in uh, 1966, 67, 15 rounds with Ernie Terrell, who couldn't fight at all. There was a German fighter named Karl Meldenberger who rocked Ali, chased him out of the ring. 
Okay, that was Ali at his worst during his prime. Yeah, Mike Tyson at his worst during his prime. Close twelve round, close twelve round. Um, sorry, close ten round decision over Tillis. But then ten that rounds out of ten rounds against Mitch Blood Green. Twelve rounds against Bone Crusher Smith. Twelve rounds over Tony Tucker. That was his worst. So when you look at their best, they at their best they both look great. Mm. But when you look at what they were on the downside, Ali, you know, he was he he wasn't always that uh, spectacular. So, but the first time. I would give that to Ali. The second time, I think Mike would would, uh, would, 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 would he would he would come out winging shots. It would be over soon. I think that's a, I think that's a, a good call. I see it. You know the wisdom, experience of Ali the first time, and seeing through that the second time, right? Yeah. Right. Now you're doing lots of other wonderful things, Steve. You've had a great career. You know you've met. Unbelievable icons, fascinating people along the way. You know, you're CEO also of the uh, Boxing Hall of Fame in uh, in Las Vegas, right? You know, yes. Well, yeah. Well, well, ours is only online. It's only uh, a, a website. The Facebook page we have is uh, enormous. It's uh, eight hundred thousand followers. That's more than the Baseball Hall of Fame, the Football Hall of Fame, the Basketball Hall of Fame, all put together. That's how many boxing followers there are on our Facebook page. Getting an exhibit, a physical exhibit, is very difficult to do mm-hmm. because there's very little space in Las Vegas, number one, mm-hmm. and the amount of money it costs to rent a space is enormous. And mm-hmm. once again, the mainstream, you know, unless you're right on the strip where tens of thousands of people are walking by, anywhere off the strip, it won't make it. It just won't yeah. make it. The mainstream is different now. And to give you an example of how how different the mainstream is now than it was 30 years ago, in one of the hotels here, the Hilton Hotel, which was called which is now called the Westgate, it's about a mile off the strip. They had an incredible Elvis Presley Museum. It was yeah. thirty five thousand square feet. Magnificent. His cars, his robes, his jewelry, artwork, incredible. It went out of business in one year. In one year. Elvis Presley. Now, why? Because the young, the mainstream now is not what it was 30 years ago. They want to gamble. They want to have the restaurants. They want to hang around the hotels. Or take a quick drive over to a marijuana dispensary to pick up some marijuana or take a drive over to the thousands of massage parlors and come back. But to go to an Elvis Presley museum off the strip, that's not gonna happen. That's just not gonna happen. So to to do a physical exhibit, it'd be very difficult, number one, because it'd be cost. It's gotta be someplace where um, many people walk by and then you have to have all the assets, meaning you have to have the rights for the films, and you have to have a tremendous amount of display material. So we we concentrated on the web. That's that was the future, as I was told ten years ago, and my Lift. teacher, my teacher was right. She said, "Concentrate yeah. on the web. Concentrate on the web." Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And tell us about because you've got a a really massive collection of unique memorabilia, twenty thousand plus pieces, isn't it? Or something. Do you want to tell us well, a little bit about that? Yes, well, the, uh, because there was no real opportunity to uh, display the material, our, my partners and I decided to, to sell them display memorabilia because it was just sitting in a, store, in a couple of storage rooms doing nothing. So whatever they did with it in terms of selling it, auctioning it, it was never going to be used. We have digital images of yeah. the material, which can always be... Uh, used and blown up and put on a photograph and put on a wall, but it would still have to be in a physical exhibit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the, the video was easy. That's easy to keep because it's all digital. Yeah. But the display material, uh, you know, is sitting in, is sitting in a storage lock, locker. Uh, people, you know, on even on the web, 
a Facebook page, they'll look at a photograph of a Muhammad Ali or Joe Lewis or Jack Dempsey, the boxing audience we have. And we put on a video of, of those fighters and that's sufficient. But getting a physical exhibit, uh, that, that would be tough. You know, it's uh, uh, unless you're right on a mainstream, a downtown yeah. London somewhere, Time or on 42nd change. Street. Steve, you know, times have, times have changed. So um, it's been wonderful talking to you. It really has, you know, I, you know, and uh, listening to them stories, you know, they're timeless, you know, they're, they're uh, historic, you know, you know, they're going to go on and on, uh, Steve, long after we're here for sure, you know, and um, so what's, what's in the future now for, uh, for you, Steve Law? Well, what we're doing is we're putting all our time and effort on the web. On Facebook and YouTube, when you put videos on there and people watch, they pay you from Facebook and YouTube. That's called monetization. Yay. So we spend all, all our time in doing that. They've changed the rules a lot where you have to be very careful about what you put on. And you want to make sure that uh, what you put on, you're permitted to use and not a promoter or a, a venue calling you and saying, what rights do you have? So it's very tricky, but that's where the that's what we're concentrating on is that monetization. So that's what we do all day long is produce short documentaries that can go on YouTube and Facebook. And uh, it's one thing if it was a subject that I did not like, but it's a subject I love. And in doing that, it's something that when someone mentions the name of a fighter, because for 30 years, all I did was watch the films to edit them, the fight goes through my brain round by round. Yeah. So I know what I want to put in the documentary. I know what interviews there are of the fighter. I know what training sequences there are of the fighter. So in my brain, once I say, okay, this, this theme of this particular fight, let me work on that. I know what sections to pull. I know what the best uh, exciting parts, interviews, training to make it a documentary. So it's something I love to do. And I love the fighters. They, they're very special. The it comes down to the fighters. They're all very special. Yeah, absolutely. So Steve, a last question. Here's a last question right, for the audience. In, I don't know, let's say 50 years, 100 years time, right? How do you think of history? What is history going to say about Mike Tyson? Yeah, he'll be one of the most celebrated people. You know, uh, uh, not perhaps uh, with up there with Mahatma Gandhi or, uh, you know, Muhammad Ali, maybe, or, you know, some people like that. But he'll be remembered pretty well in the same way now that, uh, you know, while Ali fought in the 60s, he's still remembered by a lot of people. That name power is huge. And as an example, the exhibition he fought. So there'll be a, some fighters that will be remembered. Most will have been forgotten. 99% of the fighters today who fight in 25 years, I seriously doubt that the name Mayweather will be remembered in, in 10 or 15 years. He just doesn't have that aura about him. That has, the aura is different than success. There's a big difference. Bernard Hopkins is in, was incredibly successful with 20 title defenses. But if you walk down the street, nobody knows his name now, yeah. you know. So in 25 years, nothing. Tyson will be remembered, Ali. Hopefully there'll be a fighter coming along that will be remembered in that regard. That depends, that depends on the trainers. If they can get one of their fighters to be entertaining. People want to see entertainment. They want to see a, a motion picture, the audience, where there's excitement, where there's spectacular. They, you know, the, the, the dramas of the 40s, 50s, and 60s, the mainstream will not be attracted to those. So the answer to your question, in 40, 50, 60 years, Ali, Mike Tyson, I don't know of any other name, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, maybe? Very few others. Steve Lott. Thanks. Thanks for joining us today. You know, uh, 
you're looking so healthy over there, you know, really, in Las Vegas. And I, uh, you know, we wish the very best, you know, to all you guys over there in this time, you know, the US audiences. And look, you know, I look forward to talking, talking to you again, Steve, you know, even seeing you. One time we may be over there soon, I may be over there myself sometime later in the year or early, you know, early, earlier the year just after that. But look, thanks for coming on, you know, and sharing, sharing with us uh, these wonderful stories about you back in the iconic days with Mike Tyson. Thank you. My pleasure. Just don't tell the police where I live because they're still looking for me. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. I'll see you. Thanks for tuning in, guys to a wonderful new segment of The Big Shift with Stephen Gillen. Make sure to subscribe, like, go into stephengillen.com and sign up for more wonderful content to expedite, help and support you on your own personal journey of success.